Okay, so the topic of today's lecture is differential quantization. And then we're going to talk a little bit about vocoding at the end. Okay, and so as I said, you know, one reason that you want to quantize things, a lot of times you're doing quantization for a real world audio signal like music or speech. And so, in fact, uh, one thing that we didn't really talk about too much in our last lecture on quantization was the fact that the adjacent samples of the signal are usually redundant in the sense that if you know what sample n minus 1 was, you could probably do a pretty good job predicting what sample n is. I mean, you'll have some error, but the prediction will be pretty good. And as I mentioned at the very end of the last class, you can do better by coding up that error instead of coding up the original sample values. And so the idea is to take advantage of correlations between adjacent sample values. Right? So instead of sending xn through the quantizer, and getting you know, quantized values x hat of n, why don't we instead consider quantizing uh, y of n, which is the difference between what I have now and my previous sample, and I send that through the quantizer, and then I get a set of differences y n from which I could reconstruct the original signal. Right? That's kind of the fundamental concept. and so. Why would this be a good thing? Well, let's think about what is the expected value of yn squared, right? Assuming that everything is zero mean, what is the variance of yn going to be? Well, we just work this out. It's the expected value of xn like this squared. So I get this, I get one of these, and I get one of these. And we gave these guys names already, right? So the expected value of xn squared, that's just the variance of x. So we called that r0. And then this guy here is basically x and then x lagged by 1, right? So this is going to be 2r1. And this guy at the end is another one of these. So what we really have is this. And I'm going to write that in a slightly different way, sorry. A slightly different way as. Uh, 2r0, 1 minus r1 over r0. And so the idea here is I would like the variance of the difference to be smaller than the variance of the original thing, right? And here I can see that I can actually compute the variance of the difference. And what is that? Well, if, let me just move a page up here. So If this number, r1 over r0, is greater than a half, right, that means that this guy here inside the parentheses, this is going to be less than a half. And then that means that this thing is going to be less than r0, which is the original variance. Right? And so what this says is that if the sample values are significantly correlated, then the variance of the difference is going to be a lot lower than the variance of the original signals. And I can do better, number one, I'll have smaller numbers to code, and number two, I can put more quantization levels for this. You know, I can get more bang for the buck by putting all my levels into these low numbers instead of spreading them out over the whole possible range of x, right? And so it turns out that for speech, this number is approximately 0 0.85, right? So that means that, you know, especially for voice signals, I can do a really good job with differential quantization instead of regular quantization. Okay? And so the idea is let's build a filter diagram where we're quantizing the error instead of the original signal. And so how would that work? So the idea would be I would take my original signal, I would also delay it by one unit. And I take the difference of these things, and that's what I basically put through my coder or my channel. 
And then at the other side, I take what I've got, and I have to remember what I got on the previous sample, and I add those things together to get back my estimate of x, right? And so this is the basic simple structure of a differential quantizer, okay? And so the key question is, you know, there's, there's actually no, here, the way I drew this, it's assuming that there's like no noise, no quantization, right? I'm just sending the differences, just the raw differences through the channel, right? Now, uh, in practice, I have to deal with the non-ideal effects that happen when the channel messes things up and when I quantize the thing. So let's think about where would be the right place to quantize. So the natural thing you might think of first is, you know, if I quantize the signal here, um, so let me call this, you know, point number one, right? So let's think about what happens if we do that. So if we quantize at point number one, then we can think about what is the kind of transfer function of the overall system, right? So at this point, the thing that goes into the channel is basically um, this error, which is the original signal, and then I have this delay, and then I have this noise, right? So this is basically, uh, this is the quantizer noise signal. Right, that's like saying that what I actually send is the actual error plus a little bit of quantizer noise, right? And then let's look at what happens over at the other side. The other side, I have the reconstruction is just basically undoing what I put through the channel. And I kind of apply the inverse transformation. And so what I would get would be the original signal plus the quantizer noise over this thing. And this is bad, right? Why is it bad? It's bad because what's happening is that I am basically integrating the, the noise, right? I'm taking the noise I had before and I'm adding the noise I had the previous sample, right? So that means that as my time goes forward, I'm only adding, you know, my, I'm, I'm kind of increasingly adding the quantizer noise. I can't really recover from the fact that my, you know, output is created by aggregating a bunch of noisy inputs. That means the output is increasingly going to diverge from the true output. That's bad, right? So this is bad because noise is aggregating or integrating. And this could be worse than just adding noise to the original signal, right? So we want to find a way to kind of get around this. And so the key idea is we have a little bit of a smarter structure. And that's called DPCM, Differential Pulse Code Modulation. So better is DPCM, or Differential Pulse Code Modulation. And the key idea of this, before I draw the filter structure, is that what we're going to do is we're going to quantize the difference between the original signal, the actual signal, and basically a prediction that I would get from the noisy values that come out the other side. So the idea is that the sender is basically looking at what the receiver is going to see. It's, it's looking at the quantized values. It's going to predict the signal value from these quantized values and then send the difference between that prediction and the actual signal, right? So the way that works is as follows. So I'm still going to have a difference, okay? So this is going to be a little, little goofy here. So I'm going to have a difference that I quantize. And so let's call the quantized difference signal this, okay? And that difference is what I'm going to send through my channel. Now, what's actually going to happen is I'm going to take that difference and I'm going to use it to make a prediction. And that prediction is going to give me an estimate. And that estimate 
is what I use to, yeah, this is a plus, this is a minus, right? That estimate is what I'm going to use to form this difference. And then that estimate gets fed back over here. Like so. So let me write down kind of what's happening inside this structure, right? So the error, right, the error is the difference between what I put into the quantizer and what I get out of the quantizer, okay? This D of n is defined as the difference between my original input and my predicted input. And I'm going to kind of rearrange this a little bit. And this guy here is exactly the difference. So this, this is exactly my quantized x cube, right? That's like saying, how does the receiver know how to reconstruct the signal estimate? It takes the thing that comes out of the predictor and adds to it the difference in quantization. I guess this. And so the key idea is that the difference in the quantization, the error in the quantization, is the same thing as the error in the signal. The error in the reconstructed x is the same as the error in the reconstructed d. So that means that nothing is getting amplified or accumulated or integrated at the receiver. The error that I get in my output for the x is exactly the same as whatever quantization I error I had going in, right? And so that's good. That means that um, the quantizer is not making anything worse, okay? And then how does the um, receiver understand what to do with the uh, stuff it gets? So at the receiver end, all I'm getting is these quantized differences. And the receiver has the same predictor that the sender has. So this is going to be the estimate x. And then it adds these things together. So at the receiver, you know, all I'm doing is I'm taking the very same prediction algorithm that's inside the sender, and I'm adding to it the quantized differences that are getting sent over the channel, right? And so as long as the receiver and the sender agree on the prediction algorithm, then everything should be good, right? And so let's talk for a second what this predictor is. So uh, for example, this x hat of n could be a pth order linear predictor, assuming the input is an AR process. So we talked about AR processes a few weeks ago. The idea would be that my prediction, for example, could be the filtering of a bunch of previous values of x, right? And then I would choose these AKs to minimize the difference, right? And we talked about exactly how to do that before. That was the whole thing with the Yule Walker equations. How would I minimize the error in a given uh, prediction, right? This is the desired output. This is the filter that goes in the input, right? So let me make this a little bit more concrete with an example of a predictor, okay? So let's suppose that we use just a simple first order predictor, okay? So how would this work? So a simple first order predictor. The idea would be that my output, or I'm sorry, my input is basically predicted as a multiple of my previous input, right? This A is something that I can tune, okay? <laughs> and then my error is the difference between my current sample and my prediction, which is just going to be this guy. The prediction, of course, is only going to use 
it's really only using the quantized estimates that it's able to produce, right? So it is that the prediction is taking place only on the stuff that the receiver is producing, which means it's using the quantized estimates of x to do its prediction. And so on the uh, sending side, what this looks like is the following. So I have basically this thing, which goes into a quantizer. I have my quantized difference. And then I have my quantized estimate. I put that through a delay. That gives me a x q n minus 1. I subtract these two things over here, and then I feedback this thing like this. Yeah. Right, so to get the quantized estimate time n, I take the difference I had before and I add to it my prediction, and that gets differenced with the current input, and this is my predictor loop here. And then if I wanted to kind of send this through my channel, the way that I would reconstruct this would be to say, OK, I take what comes in, and I basically have a delay here that is the same as the prediction. And then that guy here is going to be my x hat of n, which is just the the delayed version of what I got on my last step. So my x q of n is going to be my d q of n plus a x q of n minus 1. Right? So there's kind of a specific example of a quantization scheme where I've got a very simple predictor. Okay? If a was equal to 1, this would be just basically like saying, predict the next sample as the current sample. But it could be that if the samples were, for example, continuously decreasing or something like that, then I might have A being less than 1. And so again, what we really would want to do now is to say, how would I choose this AR prediction coefficient A to minimize the difference between the desired signal and, uh, well, to minimize the variance of the desired signal, right? And that's exactly the kind of thing we talked about when we were doing AR processes. In this case, it's particularly simple to be able to do. The Yule Walker equation is just reduced to a single thing. So let's talk about that. So what I want to do is I want to I want to minimize the expected value of this thing as a function of A. Well, let's just think about what that is. That's the expected value of this difference. And again, I can work out what this all means. And this looks a lot like the thing that I was working on before. Again, this is an R0. This is an R1. This is another R0. And I want to take the derivative with respect to A and set it equal to 0. That means I have minus 2R1 plus 2A R0 equals 0. And that tells me that I should choose my optimal A as R1 over R0. And then I can plug in that in this case, my expected value of dn squared at my optimal a turns out to be this number. And again, since uh, r1 is always less than r0, that means that my a is going to be less than or equal to 1. That means that this number here is going to be uh, less than or equal to r0, which is this. So again, this tells me that sending the difference is always better than sending the actual thing. And lots of real-world quantization systems are actually going to be using differential quantization instead of regular quantization. 
And if you had more a, if you had more a's, if you had more uh, linear prediction coefficients, you could presumably drive the error down even more. And you could do the analysis to figure out how much more you could expect the error to go, how much further down you could expect it to go. Okay. So let me stop and ask questions or comments about this. So one real world issue is that in practice, you know, this, so we talked a lot about uh, assumptions that were made when the signal was assumed to be stationary. What that means is the statistics of the signal are not changing over time. But in the real world, the statistics of signals change all the time, right? And so in practice, you might want to kind of constantly change your predictor. Right to to keep up with the signal as well as possible, and so um, let's talk about that a little bit. So uh, we could do even better. With adaptive DPCM. So the idea being, for example, we split the signal into small frames. So for example, we might use like 10 to 20 milliseconds of speech. And then we would estimate the AR parameters corresponding to just that frame. Right, that would be a new predictor every frame, then we would code the residual of this AR prediction. That's where the quantization part comes in. And then we would have to send both the residuals, the coded residuals, and the prediction coefficients. Right, so here's a case I have an extra F here. Here's a case where, again, I'm kind of trading off sending a little bit more information for hopefully doing a little bit better. And the cost of that is I have to send this, what I would call, side information. Right? Because the problem is that now the receiver doesn't know exactly what the uh, coder is doing unless the coder is also telling it, by the way, I changed my prediction and now it's this. Right? So you lose a little bit in terms of having to send these prediction coefficients, but at the same time, you may gain much, much more in terms of the quantization error for the same bit rate. And so usually this trade-off is something that you're willing to make. Okay? And there are lots of interesting uh, dimensions to how you might actually solve this problem in practice. Right? So this is kind of like the big picture, but then there's questions about you know what is the best way to uh, code up these coefficients and send them along. Right? I could just send the raw a values, or it turns out that it could be good to send the, we talked about this levinson durbin algorithm that had these called reflection coefficients inside the algorithm that kind of were equivalent to helping me reconstruct the uh, AR coefficients. And so I could send the levinson durbin coefficients instead of the actual AR parameters. Um, then you could do things like coding or quantizing each of these parameters at different fidelities, right? So it may be that you care a lot about getting the A parameters right. And maybe you care differently about you know, the A1 versus the A2. And then you also have the errors that you want to code up. So it could be that you're actually using a different number of bits for each of the little bits of information that you send. right? So that things can become kind of very complicated. So let me just say that there are many kind of variations or approaches to obtain um, kind of good bitrate SNR trade-offs. And so I'm not going to talk really any more about that than I just said. Let me just say one thing about um, you know, coding the residuals. right? So we talked about uniform quantizers and non-uniform quantizers. So um, you know, the residual residuals should be coded uh, non-uniformly for the best results. 
So kind of some reasons for that are, you know, one is that if I have a large residual and I clip it to like the highest quantization level, then I'm going to get some sort of audible distortion. So clipping uh, residuals produces audible distortion. So you don't want to have, you know, your uh, quantizer poorly matched to the range of the residuals. Otherwise, you're going to hear some bad stuff. Um, and kind of along with that is that if I have really large residuals, I need to make sure that those are coded well. Because that represents the places where the prediction is the worst. So high amplitude residuals uh, must be coded accurately. And at the same time, the residual can be uh, severely center clipped without much audible distortion. Right? So it means that if I mistakenly send an error of 0 0.0005 instead of 0 0.0006, that's not the end of the world because that means the prediction was great to begin with, right? And so if I add a little bit of extra or a little bit less, I'm not going to hear anything different, right? Whereas if the prediction was bad and then I miscode the difference, then I could get something that really sounds very unlike the original, right? And so that means that you end up with quantizers that could be maybe like kind of flat in the middle, and then I put some bins up at the sides, right? And again, the way to do this the right way is to match your... Uh, quantizer for the residual to the statistics of the signal that you've got, right? So a good practice is to basically say, okay, I'm going to take, you know, a bunch of examples of the speech or the music or whatever that I'm going to try, try and push through the channel, and then I'm going to find the optimal quantizer using the methods that we talked about last time. For example, you could use this Lloyd Max quantizer to find the best non-uniform levels for the signal. Okay. And so again, this gets into a little bit more like communication theory and audio coding than we're talking about this class. This is a good way to, to talk about it. So an extremely simple quantizer, one thing I want to talk about is um, super simple, maybe I should say it's a super simple um, version of DC, DPCM, is what's called delta modulation. You may have already heard about this in another class. This is basically like a one-bit quantizer. And this is really, really simple. So the idea is at the uh, coder, I basically take the difference between my current signal and my predicted signal. And if this is positive, then I send a 1 bit. And if it's negative, I send a 0 bit. And at the decoder, I reconstruct my signal by looking at what I got last time and adding to it a you know positive delta if I received a 1 and a negative delta if I received a 0. Right? That is like a super simple, super naive way of coding a signal. And kind of what happens is that in practice, I get something like this, right? So if I have a, um, if I have an input signal like this, what's going to happen is that my reconstructed signal is basically going to look something like this, like kind of a stair-steppy thing that says, okay, I'm trying to keep up with my signal, and then if I you know, find myself going down, I take these stair steps going down. Now here's a problem, right? The problem is that since I'm always just adding my uniform step of either plus delta or minus delta, right? So the distance between steps is always delta. That means if the signal really increases quickly, then all I can do is keep on adding deltas, right? But if the signal is going up by a lot more than delta, then I get what's called slope overload, 
right? That means that the signal is going faster than the quantizer can catch up to. And kind of by the same token, you could also get something like this, where the signal is kind of like bouncing back and forth when the signal is basically constant. This is called uh, granular noise. Right, that happens when basically the coder, in this case, you can see that the coder here doesn't allow for basically there being a steady state. Right, if I'm constant, the coder is always just going to keep on bouncing around between one and zero. And that means that my reconstructed signal is going to look like this. And so the argument here then is that basically we would like to, uh, well, on the one hand, if you knew a lot about your signal, you could try to choose delta to be um, the best thing that you could, but you're always going to have some manifestation of these kinds of problems. And so the more natural thing is, well, why wouldn't I just change the step size instead of having it to be this same height delta all the time? Instead, I should be allowed to change how big my delta is, right? And that should adapt to what the signal is doing. And so a better thing to do is to um, do better by adaptation. That's something that says that my delta is a multiple of my previous delta. And I have a greater than one multiple if my code word is the same as what it was before, right? That kind of implies that I'm in this overload condition where I keep on going up, 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 up. That tells me that I should make my step size bigger. And maybe I should make my step size smaller if the code word is not the same as it was before. That may mean that I'm in the situation where I'm bouncing around, so I should make my code word a little bit less. And so it turns out that even, so for example, maybe I would say, you know, here I could say, you know, maybe I choose m equals two if I'm in the overload case and m equals one half if I'm in the uh, bouncing around case, right? And it turns out that this is much better for the same bit rate. And you could do even further by basically uh, doing what's called continuously variable slope delta modulation. Right, in that case, basically my delta is some linear function of the previous delta if I'm in this kind of overload case, right? This is kind of like saying that if I've said the same thing three times in a row, then I better change my delta. And if not, then I should, you know, do something else. And so I should make basically P large to respond to overloads. And I should make M between 0 and 1. So step size decays otherwise. Right? So basically here, this is like saying that if I'm not in the overload case, I should generally try and make my delta is smaller and smaller, and then once I get back into this case, then the P is going to boost my delta up a lot, right? And so in this case, my delta can be changing, you know, kind of dynamically uh, every frame. Okay. So comments or questions about this? Okay. So the last thing I want to talk about is a little bit of a diversion from this, but also kind of fun, is what are called vocoders, okay? So, and this stands for basically voice encoders. And so, kind of all the stuff we've been talking about so far is kind of under the assumption that we want to reproduce the original signal as accurately as possible, right? In most situations, that's what we want. But 
There are other situations where we don't necessarily want to exactly reproduce the original signal, but we want to use the original signal to drive some very low bit rate other signal, right? So the idea is that instead of trying to represent speech signals exactly, we can try to make a kind of a synthetic speech sound that kind of sounds enough like the original. Without trying to match the waveform exactly. Right? And so one example of this is, for example, in military communications back in the day when you want to transmit orders to somebody in the field or in a plane or something like that, and it doesn't really matter whether your tone of voice or intonation or anything like that gets through. What matters is that the words are getting through to the pilot or the soldier, right? And so the idea is that you can use this to make synthetic speech that uh, kind of sounds like what you're originally saying but doesn't really reflect the actual waveform of the input, okay? And so here's the kind of way that this works, right? And I'll show you a bunch of examples. So this is called the channel vocoder. There are other kinds of vocoders, but this is the simplest one. So the idea is that my voice comes in, and that voice gets put through a set of bandpass filters. Right? So you might think of these as low pass, you know, a little bit higher frequency, a little bit higher frequency, all the way up to high frequencies, right? So I can basically design a bunch of bandpass filters that cover the whole speech band. Then I also have a uh, pitch detector, right? That's going to basically give me a sense of is this a male voice or a female voice, for example. Uh, and then I have a, actually, maybe I should switch this. Well, I, I do need that, but let me. Also say I have basically like a voicing detection. Right, so again, we talked about that a little bit before where a voice sound is one that if you put your fingers against your uh, you know, windpipe and you say ah uh, or ooh, you can feel your uh, vocal cords vibrating, whereas if you say tss or tss or tss, you don't feel any vibration, right? So you can kind of detect in speech whether that's happening or not. This is going to get, give me basically some sort of a frequency. And then each of these guys is going to get passed through basically a, uh, I'm going to get the magnitude of each of these guys. These are going to get passed through some more filters, like low pass filters, for example. And then I would do some more stuff like I would decimate or downsample the signal, and then I would send the coded result. And so the idea is that what I'm going to do is to kind of mimic the speech, I'm basically filtering each of these bandpass signals of the original speech, and I'm quantizing each of them differently, probably. And then I'm going to also send over the pitch and the, and the voicing. And then to reconstruct my signal, what I'm going to do is something like this, where I'm going to, um, and so all this stuff gets sent again over some channel. At the other side, what I'm going to get is I'm going to get the results of all of these filters, and so let me just kind of say these are all my bandpass filters. Um, I'm going to have a switch that basically says, okay, depending on whether my uh, signal is voiced or unvoiced, 
there's a switch. And then if my uh, signal is voiced, then I need to use my uh, kind of pulse generator. to make some sort of a, for example, a pure tone at that frequency. And if the signal is unvoiced, then I would basically use like a noise generator. So kind of, again, the idea here is that, you know, if I'm saying a voice signal like ah, uh, ah, uh, I, can, I can do that voice signal at different frequencies, right? And that depends on, again, my gender and my tone of voice and so on. Whereas it's hard to make like a s, I can't really do a s at different frequencies, right? It's just like, sounds like noise, right? So the idea is if I wanted to make a s sound, I would basically filter noise. Whereas if I wanted to make a vocal sound, a, a vowel or a bzz, then I would need to make a input pulse that I'm going to filter with my results of my bandpass signals, right? So this is basically going to go like this, where depending on whether I'm voiced or unvoiced, uh, how do I want to draw this here? This is kind of a crummy picture, but something like this. So kind of what I'm doing is I'm multiplying my input signal, either noise or pulse, with the output of each of these filters. I'm going to kind of multiply this again, putting these results back into the right bandpass regions. And then I'm going to add these signals up to get my output speech. And so the idea is that this is basically a way of making what sounds kind of like a robotic voice. Okay. And so, again, if you've used a synthesizer or something like that, this is kind of like one of the things that's inside a analog synthesizer. And usually, you know, it's poor in quality, right? It doesn't sound like a human, but is very intelligible. Right? And so um, that means that you can use it in applications like military communication where you just care about intelligibility. You don't care about whether you have this warm tone that you get from talking to someone over the phone. Right? And so, for example, you could do extremely low bit rate, like 1,000 bits per second uh, voice communication with a vocoder system. Um, so there are lots of variations for this. Let me just write down a few notes. So variations, or comments, I would say. So the first thing is what I just said, extremely low bit rate, but kind of what I would say unnatural speech can be generated. For example, maybe I could do like one kilobit per second speech. Um, and I guess I should add this, this speech is also intelligible. So I can make speech that sounds good or sounds understandable, but it doesn't sound like a human. Um, what else do I want to say? So instead of using. Um, Instead of using synthetic excitation, use voice excitation. Right? What that means is that instead of on the receiver side having the input be generated by this either you know tone or noise, instead I could imagine that I replace this part with a filtered version of the original speech, for example, something where I kind of use human speech to be able to drive this guy here. So that means that, you know, uh, like a low pass filtered version of the original speech. And that avoids questions of 
automatically detecting the right pitch of the signal and stuff like that. Uh, although you have to use higher bit rate to send that low pass filter version of the speech along with it. Um, then there are variations. There's one called the formant vocoder. That means that instead of just pushing the signal through a bunch of bandpass filters, right? So for example, in a real vocoder, you might use 14 or 20, like a long filter bank of bandpass filters. Instead, what you might try and do is look at the spectrum of the signal and find kind of the natural frequencies or formants of the input and pass those through instead. That means that um, you can probably get a lower bit rate, but it's harder to estimate those formants. Um, so I'll just say lower bit rate but estimation is tricky. And then another one is called the phase vocoder. And again, this is something that is often used for just basically changing the pitch of an in incoming speech and then kind of use different um, filter banks or excitation signals, excitation, that. At the synthesizer for pool effects, right? So instead of trying to make the speech mimic in tone, the original speech, what I could try to do instead is to try and make cool sounding robotic voices, right? And so let's just look at some examples of that. Uh, if my uh, let's see here. So I'm not sure if this is going to play. Right? Right? So there's a case where you're kind of passing the original speech through this thing that is probably, you know, it's, it doesn't sound like original speech, but it sounds kind of like this robotic y voice, right? And of course, you know, the, the main thing is. Daft Punk, right? So we can mute this for a second. But Daft Punk uses, you know, vocoders and things like vocoders in much of their, um, much of their music. Right? And here you can see, I'm not sure whether I can get this to work because it was giving me an ad, but let's try this again. Uh, I don't want to watch a minute and a half of Kristen Bell. Oh, here we go. Right, so here's a guy who's singing the same song, doing it live with his own synthesizer, right? So he's, you know, doing the instrumental track, and then he's just singing through the microphone to pass it through to his vocoder, right? And uh, I found this. So basically, any, you know, so when I was, I don't know if you watched the original Transformers, like Soundwave, right, is a transformer -y kind of vocoder voice. So kind of a good rule of thumb is, if it sounds like a kind of a robotic-y voice, that's probably a vocoder. And just as a, as a side note, there are a couple of things that can be confused with vocoders, not exactly vocoders. So for example, you know, um, Stevie Wonder used this um, thing called a talk box, right, which sounds kind of similar, but it's a little bit different. So here, 
So what he's doing here is he's playing keyboard sounds through that tube that goes into his mouth. And then he's using his mouth to modify the waveform that goes out into the microphone, right? So he's basically playing like the piano tones into his mouth, and then he's shaving his mouth and singing around it, right? So this is not exact, this is not a vocoder at all, right? This is just basically he's using his own mouth as a resonant cavity to shape the incoming waveform and output that to the microphone. And then finally, there is the dreaded auto tune, right? Right, so this is really the first auto-tuned auto song. I'm sure you can think of many other auto-tuned songs. So the difference here between auto-tuning and vocoding is that what's happening is that they are basically estimating the instantaneous pitch of the incoming waveform and nailing it to a particular note to make it sound like it's on key, okay? and so. When you do this in a subtle way, it just sounds like you're singing in tune, right? You can find lots of examples of people who have kind of done do-it-yourself auto-tune where they sing into the microphone and then they turn on auto-tune and suddenly all their notes are on key. It sounds like they're still the one singing, but they've kind of nailed each, each note to the right place. And if you really uh, crank up the effect to make it so that the notes are just basically like rigid things like this, then you get the share sound where basically it, it sounds like share but it also sounds kind of like a robot, right? And so a good rule of thumb is that if it sounds like the original singer passed through some sort of weird filter, then it's probably auto-tune. If it sounds like a robot, then it's probably a vocoder, right? And so, and it, it gets a little bit confusing because to make this pitch detection and, and nailing to the note effect, you can use one of these things called a phase vocoder, which is basically like a thing that you can use to change the pitch of a note while keeping its duration and other qualities the same, right? That's really what we're doing here. Um, so yeah, interesting stuff. Uh, all right, comments or questions? All right, so let me stop my recording.